for day three of the world's group stage. We've now seen all teams in action, and with a stacked competition, we are up for a close race to the quarterfinals. The reigning champions Invictus Gaming have shown signs of former glory, and today they face the young superstars of Dom One Gaming. Hello, everyone. I'm Shox, joined by Frosk, Jat, and Papa Smithy. But of course, the players are much more interesting than us. So we're going hey. to take a look at IG for just a little bit, and Dom One, who are playing in the first game of the day and back to us there we go a very good one to kick things off welcome to the desk day three can i get some kind of overarching thoughts of the first two days from you guys who wants to attack it first Jack? Mm. yeah i feel like the first two days have gone mostly to expectations mm -hmm. aside from a team like fun plus phoenix dropping their first game we're still super early on. The biggest thing I'd say is the game's been a little bit slower, but we still have so much Worlds left to play. Yeah, the results-wise, I'm with you, but specifically the meta has been a little bit slower than maybe the proactive meta we thought coming in. However, two days in, there's plenty of surprises still to come. Anything to add, Frost? G2 look like the scariest team at the tournament next to SKT, so yeah. I'm very excited. I'm glad you brought up SKT. They had an epic bout, of course, yesterday versus RNG. And uh, yeah, one of the highlights of the day came very early because it was only the first game of the day. And Clint just walked up for one of the best engages we've seen. How did Uzi get caught by this? Aside from that play, I felt like RNG with the double Infernal, nearly triple Infernal, with great team fighting, had a pretty good showing. But ultimately, it was SKT who came through with the split push. Yeah, the split push, the map play in particular, taking multiple globals, not just in the Twisted Fate, but also in the key summoner spell of Teleport. And as we watch the LPL teams, I want to point viewers' attention to the fact that LPL teams prioritize combat summoners over the TP, which could leave them exposed for this. And while this was Thrill a Minute, I think a lot of people would have loved it. There were a lot of macro errors, and SKT, with their initiation options, chose not to side lane, chose to fight a lot of the game. I thought actually they'd given too much back to RNG. I thought RNG would close it, but in the clutch, they really reorientate, they close it out, and they ultimately pick up the win. Yeah, and I think it's really interesting to try and analyze SKT's performance there, because yes, they made mistakes, but also they still won. Mm -hmm. So how much of it can be cleaned up and do we want to kind of give them a pass for and how much do we want to give them credit for actually pivoting mid game from forcing team fights to split pushing? I'm a little on the side of saying, hey, the fact they're able to change strategies mid game shows their experience and their poise and I want to give them props for it. Well, Papa Smithy, I'd also like to just have you for a minute speak to sure. what you've seen of SKT so far because this is the year that we're looking at Korea again to see if they're going to bounce back from last year. Are they the strongest representative for the LCK so far? I think that is pretty clear. And how strong do you think they are? I think that question, the former question is a freebie because they yeah. have been the strongest Korean team by a long way, but they've also shown the diametric difference between them an experienced, very experienced lineup compared to Griffin and Damwon kind of making rookie mistakes. And we should accept that. We should embrace Griffin and Damwon. I think they were built up to be contenders just based on the region and the fact that people are seeing power in Korea. But I think they need time to get everything going at Worlds 2019. We can't overreact. With no. that said, G2 is the best team in the world. <laughs> <laughs> Nailed it. Well, um, G2, of course, is on the road to their Grand Slam. And yesterday was a big test. All jokes aside, they were very impressive in their game versus Griffin. Yeah, they ran Griffin over and they did it with a composition that we don't normally see G2 running. This had a lot of scaling elements, a lot of kind of standard champions when they'd really made their birth on the international stage, playing those crazy picks like the Pike Top. So this just says good things if you're a G2 fan, because they're showing all of their versatility in champion draft. And I think there was a lot of anxiety from G2 fans with all the hype they had coming in, especially when they see a draft of champions that they didn't really play in the summer split. And all of that turned into relief after they saw the way G2 executed. It's one of those weird things where I think Europe has to come in as the regional favorites in terms of overall picking your region, picking which one's most likely to win. But Europe has never been in that position before. It was Korea, even up until last year's world. So that's the funny thing, is that holding that mantle of favorites, people want to distance themselves real quick. And it's always uh, hard to see, say things for an entire region if only some of the teams are really showing up. I do want to talk about North America and the LCS, most notably Team Liquid, who had a fantastic start versus Damwon on day one. But yesterday, they dropped the ball versus IG Jat. Yeah, and I feel like both their Damwon game and their IG game were a little bit similar, except what happened past 30 minutes was different. 
So Team Liquid here was unable to actually win the mid lane priority push and pull game against IG, had this team fight at the Baron Pit, and then the game was over during the duration of the Baron buff. Now, while they did lose this game, I for one have been very pleasantly surprised with Team Liquid because it's not just getting these random snowballs or kind of a key player that's outperforming and running away with the game. It's them actually outsmarting and having cleaner fundamentals than their opponents. And that's not something that you usually credit to the LCS teams on an international stage. I am very confident in TL. Yeah, and I'm happy that they have been able to play TL style of League mm -hmm. of Legends on the world stage because I have seen so many North American representatives not play the same way domestically as they do internationally. Now, I still think TL is in a very hard group and they've faced the two hardest opponents so far, but I'm happy with what I've seen. Let's see how things stand in those groups we just mentioned. Of course, Team Liquid in a group with IG, Dom1, um, and AHQ. So it is really hard to say who will advance, but I think our first game of the day will give us some more indication. And it's hard to make big takeaways when not every group is played twice, right? You look at SKT and IG topping groups, maybe IG will surprise people. SK Telecom, pretty expected there. It's very interesting to see the fact that we don't really have too many groups here that have gone to plan in terms of, say, Group B, where it was supposed to be one contender and three pretenders. We actually have contenders kind of filing up in every group. We'll see how things evolve in Worlds is, of course, the stage where players become legends, but sometimes they fall under the circumstances. So let's discuss some over and under performers. Okay. The first one I want to talk about is Fnatic's Nemesis. Ooh! Hmm. Nemi, I actually think he's been overperforming, because the thing is, is Fnatic Fnatic had to rebuild themselves. They lost Caps, they lost Soaz, they now are relying only on Bwipo. They pick up this rookie, no one really know what to expect from Nemesis. And not only has he been popping off on things like the Cassiopeia, the Twisted Fate domestically, but he stood his ground and he stood tall against Faker of all people. I think I agree, especially looking at the highlights from this game, his Akali being able to find the flanks and execution threat on the three carries of Clutch Gaming was so crucial in Fnatic's way of coming back in this game. I'm still waiting for his big takeover before performance in a side lane. I first understood him as a Kassadin player in EU Masters. His AD Twisted Fate has been buffed for this tournament, so there's still more growth, and yet I'm with the overperforming. The one thing I do want to see out of that, though, is more mid-jungle synergy from him and Broxa. Mm -hmm. Broxa has actually been unable to find a killer assist in the first 15 minutes of either of his games which is way different than the way he was playing in summer. In tandem with that, it's not just Brox's responsibility to the early game that needs to be tuned up. It's also the fact that Hilly is such a good roaming support. Yeah. But when you're putting him on Yumi every single game, you're not seeing the true Fnatic style, even though Garen Yumi has been a staple of one of their compositions. We'll see Fnatic again tomorrow, but Nemesis overperforming or to his level. We'll see, of course, secondly, Uzi. Now, he had a great game on Zaya yesterday. He was actually really, really fed as well. But sometimes you can't really help it that your team doesn't. You look at all these numbers, Dude, and what, 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 right? And no surprise that when it comes to things like CSD and gold percentage, you'd be way up there. But I'd say underperforming, because I always Ooh. look for those minute things from Uzi, the things that separate him from the other great 80 carries. It's great 80 carries, good 80 carries, Uzi above all of those. And there were multiple feather storms and engages he could have dodged that he was wasn't doing, and this is Uzi, a top one player. It's so tricky because you have to realize how astronomical his expectations yeah. are. And while all those stats do show what we expected, his deaths are unexpected. The fact that he wasn't reacting to Greg's casks with his IR in the SKT game, I agree. He's a slightly underperforming. I, I would say international Uzi. If you watch Uzi domestically, that's pretty standard from what you see. Sometimes he just... They're just, different players. <laughs> <though>. <laughs> just get caught out, but I agree. His international performances are usually uh, the, the cream of the crop. Is RNG's success at this World Championship going to hinge on him stepping up? I mean, yes. yes. I think RNG thinks that. So is yes. that an issue? <laughs> <laughs> well, because I mean, uh, speaking of what Raz was talking about yesterday, it's that RNG have a performing Xiaohu and a performing Longxing up in the solo lanes, but they still won't give them the priority in draft. They won't give mm -hmm. them the time of the day with the ganks. They'll always go down towards Uzi. So RNG seem to think that's their one winning strategy, but their roster is built to be so much more flexible. Mm -hmm. We'll see if they take your advice. Uh, last person I want to talk about is Ixmithy. Mm. Stellar early games in the two games we saw, so I'm not trying this. Steer your opinion in any direction, but 
No, I actually really like X Smithy. Now, the question that I always have now. for him <laughs> is uh, his effective champion pool. Now, obviously, at the professional level, you can play multiple types of champions, but there are certain key champions for X Smithy that when I see them come out, I just get excited for. Things like his Jarvan that are starting to be targeted away from him. So we've seen his Jarvan and his Gragas, and these champions have really kind of come to life for him. He's ganking a lot more. He has a lot more presence in the early game than we usually see for X Smithy. But if those champions are taken away from him, is he able to find the same performance? Well, it's worth saying, you know, you, you already use the domestic Uzi versus international Uzi. It's domestic X Smithy and international X Smithy, right? Because mm -hmm. he hasn't been able to trade upon his very reliable performances in the LCS to international events. You go back and maybe years ago in 2016, you might say yes, but his more recent years, no. So far, I don't think that I've been able to see too much negative around his performance. So. Uh, definitely thumbs in the middle to thumbs yeah. up for me. The one negative would be dying to the shy after stealing red buff, but ah, usually yeah. you contrast X Smithy's performance with the other jungler. Because X Smithy doesn't play to carry, he plays to stop the other jungler. Mm -hmm. And if I think about Canyon's game against TL or Leon's game yesterday, X Smithy's doing pretty well. Yeah, I agree with you in that one. Um, now, on to another gear, something I've not done before, and I don't know about my guests, but for years oh. I've seen it, mm. and his questions have terrorized uh -oh. the LCS <laughs> analyst desk, and now he's ready to take his talent to the international stage. It is time for the first Jot Stats of Worlds 2019. How Come does on. this work? How okay. does this work? Easy one to start. This isn't one of the three questions that'll count. Who has the highest damage per minute so far of the Worlds group stage? Either Nuguri or uh, Uzi. We saw him yesterday in the final game of the day. Jed, no. I thought this, I was told this was too easy. So uh, easy, huh? Yeah. The, who highest played DPM. the final game? He played C9. a non-marksman bot lane. On C9? Oh, sneaky. Yes. <laughs> It'll be sneaky, obviously. Yeah, it's a massive uh, DPM. You this can see 1,412 Whoa. damage per minute. We Ooh. saw the post-game graphic where he did 66k damage. I thought it was going to be so in our defense, be free. we were, you know, talking about some topics for the show today. So we didn't see that graphic. So <laughs> okay, that was difficult. Okay, so uh, <laughs> question we're one for Jack Chat. Team. Which player is tied with Uzi for the highest CS per minute? in group stage. I would think it would be a top laner and one of the top laners that would kick themselves out into a side lane. I'm assuming someone from down one? Any could be, guesses? it could be. Because he just farms like mad up the there. shy also. I'm thinking of like the fast game comes from G2, so they couldn't have had, well it's CS per minute. It's CS per minute. So, and CS it went minute. fast, so I think it's the like maybe. You think it's perks? Ca caps or per perks? Shox gets it. Wow. Okay. Two weren't even close. So here's the thing. Yeah. In but that mid game where he bias, plays Kaisa. My bias like steered me. In it's not bias. You just got it right. Yeah, okay. Uh, next question. One player in group stage has 100% kill participation. These have been hard, so I'll tell you it's a jungler. Clid. I'm going to guess. Oh. Yeah. Probably a low kill game as well. <laughs> it could be actually. It could be a one game sample size too. Answers or I can't. I mean, no. no uh, do, is phone a friend. Is it, is phone it, a friend online. Can, can I get a 50-50? Is it trouble? Is it crash? No. I don't know. I <laughs> Alex. Get it, just pick a jungler. Yankos. Okay. Levi. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh. yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Although, yeah. They yeah, he only game. played one game, one but game he had 100. Just... You don't think one game sample size is enough? This is oh. skewing then why it. are you saying G2 is the best team in the tournament? That's a fair point. Are we disappointing, uh, uh, are we disappointing in results so far as to your... This is about how well Dash did. <laughs> okay. um, so I feel like you're doing all right. All Final right. question uh, of the day is which player has the highest forward percentage in the group stage? Now, this is an over 70% number. The shy? That's huge. Yeah. A huge the shy? number. Over 70% oh. of the time, Uzi? beyond oh. the halfway point in the lane. I'm going to go back to Nuggery. It is a top laner. I'm going to say Nuggery again, but it's I'm say the, the shy right then. Answer. I guess I'll go Nuggery. Everyone's wrong. You want one final guess? No. <laughs> it is an NA player. I'm really? assuming it's licorice. Okay, they, this, all right. Like 70%. Nailed it. Anyway. <laughs> We'll do better next time, I hope. Isn't it weird? <laughs> this is a good example of how it's sometimes really hard yep. to tell things from stats. I guess. I'm with this. I'm this sorry. Stuff is hard. I just. We need more stats. We're yeah, going to see that's more. It. That's, that's the end of chat stats. Yeah. I'm um, we are going to talk a bit more about uh, the meta in general and possibly some more stats as well. Uh, so Jad is in his element. But the meta, of course, will always take shape as the games continue on at the World Championship as it's a long tournament. So we wanted to take stock of where things are at. And a lot of or a topic that's brought up quite often is, are the games slower? Are people playing more towards scaling? And is that the way to go or not? I think it's the nature of blind picks. And mm. it's not 
necessarily that teams are deciding we must play scaling to win. It's that champions like the Aurelia, the Akali, the Silas, these picks that dominated, especially in the LEC for so long, have kind of disappeared. And so the champions that people are feeling safe to blind pick, like the Zayas, the Orianas, mm -hmm. naturally have scaling built into their, their kit. And yeah. I think it, it's just a factor of that. Mm -hmm. An example is G2's composition yesterday versus Griffin, which to us was a signal of, oh, if even G2 is doing this, then that must mean something. I and mean, this was a very smart draft overall. Absolutely, especially against their opponents, Griffin, who are known for those very low kill games on both sides, no deaths, no kills. This made perfect sense. So this was, on the one hand, grabs being really heads up, but it could also herald the overall meta. We just have to use it as a data point, but not necessarily the prototype of how to play. And I do really want to hone in on a pick like the Orn in particular. I think we've also seen Renekton rise up in priority, and Renekton actually doesn't have that status of being a late game scaling champion. He's more about that lane phase and kind of that mid game power spike on Spear of Shoujin. Orn works really well as an answer to Renekton mm -hmm. because Renekton with an AP jungler can dive very easily, but Orn denies that or dissuades it because it's so dangerous to dive him with so much CC. Yeah, I think you hit the nail on the head when you're talking about the blind pickable champions not being as proactive early game because overall the game has gotten about two minutes slower than it was in the summer split but I'm not completely sure that it's going to stick because part of that I think is just game one day one day two jitters from these teams and not being willing to take risks I mean Broxa would be the perfect example of this sure. how could he not have a killer assist in the first 15 minutes so far that's definitely going to change um but if the game is slower, I feel like it does favor teams like SKT. So yeah, TLDR, maybe the safe blind picks are the scaling picks. With that jump off point of SKT, Papa Smithy, uh, do you agree with Jad there? The fact that if these are the prevalent picks and styles, SKT will only get stronger? I think you have to. Even though SKT on the first day reinvented themselves and played a very proactive style and had some nice new picks, that was a bit of a surprise. Moving on to some of the meta rates here, no surprise the Pantheon, the one really big early game focused champion, is 100% pick ban, but you start to see Kale, right? Kale at 83%. When I tried to kind of crowdsource thoughts on the kind of power shift to giving her range at level 6, I think people were kind of more erring on the side of the nerf, especially for solo queue. When it comes to the pro game, that reliability of the laning phase is making her very attractive as a pick. Yeah, she kind of has the quirky symptom where she's very safe to pick in. She can uh, roll through... Kind of lane everywhere, right? Yeah, roll through a lot of matchups and then have the late game insurance policy. But we just talked about scaling. If you looked at all those other picks, so those are all champions that either spike off of early levels or initial item power spikes. Kale's the only one that really hyperscales there. The thing is, most of those champions are banned. Banned, yeah. So it's the stuff that comes after that. Mm. If teams think that those later game champions are becoming too powerful, the game will accelerate because those ones will start getting picked again. Yeah, what would be your um, preference and what would be your prediction as to how it will evolve, Chat? It's a really I think put him on that, the spot that's question. a tricky one. I feel like the game will get about 30 seconds faster mm -hmm. on average. Perfect. <laughs> I think it will change dramatically when we get into knockout stages, and each knockout will be vastly different because we mm -hmm. have such experienced teams that can play such versatile styles. Like you look at guys like SKT, G2, um, the Fanatics of the world. We know that they can play virtually everything, early game and slow scaling game, and so that's why I'm super excited for knockout stage because I think there will be independent metas for every every single best of five, depending on how those cha uh, those teams match up. And you just even think back to last year, and you can remember the overarching kind of Aurelia, Kali, Flex, Assassins meta, that solidified in quarters. That wasn't the group stage mm -hmm. meta. And you think back to, say, the most settled meta, the Arden Sensor meta, when we're talking about 2017, that started, it mostly went proliferated until Team WE brought out the fast push Caitlyn strategy, and then that had to be banned out against certain teams. So. We haven't seen the wrinkles yet. We've seen like, the first thought from a lot of teams, two from other teams. But there's going to be some counter strategies prepped as well. Yeah, I really hope so, especially also in the second um, week of groups. Things usually get a bit spicier as well. A team that hasn't really found a winning uh, strategy just yet are the LPL champions, FPX. They did come in with very high expectations, but so far they've been a shadow of the lineup we saw in summer. Let's learn more about this mysterious super team. Thank you, Shocks. For many Western fans, you might be asking, what is the deal with FPX? This team is a contender. A lot of people have been talking about them as one of the favorites for the World Championship, but it's certainly not what we saw on the first day of groups. Yeah, absolutely. However, what I do want to stress is this is a style that FPX are used to playing. You know, we've seen throughout this uh, team's career that they're happy to play tanks or, you know, different picks in the mid lane. They do have a weak side top laner, a very early game and experienced jungler. 
And their lineup that they took in day one versus J Team is all about setting up LWX for success. This is a comp where LWX in team fights should be able to thrive. Exactly. I mean, this is the guy they call him the shotgun in the LPL because he's so good at diving in in the back line with this Kaisa, so good at team fighting on the champion. And here's some examples, you know, from the LPL finals, getting a solo pick here on Xiaohu, opening up the base, and then diving into the back line 1v4, getting a triple kill here. These are the kind of team fights that I got accustomed to seeing out of LWX and that is why you can't just look at their draft from the first game and say okay that was a mistake it really was just a miss execution but that's their bread and butter yeah absolutely and it's like not like he's doing it against bad 80 carries this guy is playing against the likes of Uzi in the domestic region so certainly expecting him to step up on the international team and I think that a lot of people would ask why do they play this style and all of it is about Doin B in the mid laner. This guy does warp the way that you approach League of Legends. When you have a look at his most played picks, he's got things like the Nordia, a Nautilus. That's the old Pantheon. He plays Rise, he plays Riven, and it's all about getting him out of the lane and impacting the map positively and accelerating that pace of the game. They still might go late, but it's always with that gold lead from the explosion between 10 and 20 minutes. And I always love how they utilize these picks because a lot of players will utilize counter picks for a lane advantage. He utilizes counter picks for a push advantage to then take that and go elsewhere on the map, snowball their superstar team fight A to E to carry LWX. And I'm very excited to see if they can remedy some of the issues that they had on the first day today, as we'll be seeing them play later on. Back to you guys. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Frosk. The shotgun, not doing too well so far. <laughs> okay, so real talk, we do call him the shotgun of the LPL, and it works like this. He either gets up close and personal and he blows you away, or, or. that kickback just knocks him flat. And that's what we saw yesterday. He dove in and he landed flat on his face. My biggest dilemma with FPX, though, is they only lost four games in the entire summer split regular season. It was one of the highest win percentages of any LPL team in any regular season and LWX had the second most kills per game of any player in <laughs> LPL history, so they were so good. And I do have to wonder if it was just a bit of a fluke that he played so badly in that first game, because my expectation, even though he was to go in, was that they would be better. And I think a lot of fans are learning about FPX and have a couple of ideas about kind of Doinby being a very creative player. What we should remember is that FPX did actually draft like they do domestics. So that part yeah. is not necessarily something that's gonna change, but the execution, that is a part they could definitely improve on, and we expect them to today. After their record in the LPL, I do think at least they deserve the benefit of the doubt. Sure. But we will be a bit wiser later today because FPX will face off against Splice in Game 3. That is a clash of styles if I've ever seen it. Things, however, will start off with IG versus Dom1. And overall, we've got a hyped day coming in. Yeah, I think you can look across the board. Every single match matters. I'm very, uh, very curious about Group B and how that one's going to shake out right in the middle of the day. And I see Griffin versus versus HKA, I assume I know where it goes, but what if it doesn't? Because Griffin need to find that first victory, and while people look past Hong Kong attitude, they only have their first world's victory when the Nexus explodes. How scared are you? You know, more scared than I thought I would. <laughs> it's gonna be real. Well then, we'll see how everything plays out and if Griffin gets that win on the board. But in Group D, reigning champions IG, they have shown signs of former greatness, but it is still far and away from their 2018 level for now. Of course, IG going up against um, Damwon, and yesterday versus Team Liquid, it was a lot about the names that we expected Frosk in Rookie and in the Shy. Okay. I get it. The Shy, Rookie, they are incredible players. They are so good that they are 2-0 up in the group, that they carried a team all the way to Worlds. Now, Jackie Love also was a strong assist there. That said, for me, Invictus Gaming is three teams right now, or excuse me, three players right now, mm -hmm. and they need someone else to step up. So for me, looking across Dan one, I kind of see the same problem. You have two key players that are playing out of their mind, and now you're just kind of waiting for who's not going to take the participation award. It's almost as if the same coach has molded both teams. Oh. Because he actually has. <laughs> IG's coach from 2018 who won the championship has been coaching Damwon. And I think there are so many similarities, not only in the champions preferred by their solo laners, but also the rest of the map. 
it really does feel like little IG in, in uh, Damwon Gaming against big IG. The actual Invictus Gaming and the coach is definitely the on-the-nose point between the two. But you look at the top laners, both known for their relentless aggression. Both probably very difficult and stubborn to change when it comes to top laners. In fact, just looking at the back and forth in interviews between the Shy and Nogri, they definitely have differing opinions on how the game should be played. But all similar styles and similar uh, roles of importance for the team. I want to look at the mid lane a bit more closely. Rookie versus Showmate. Rookie had a phenomenal game yesterday on Oriana. And for Showmaker, we're still waiting to see him make these waves on the international stage. And he's someone that I've hyped up. I think he was the best performing mid laner, not necessarily just focusing on lane, but overall package over the course of summer. And yet, hit the playoffs, found a veteran in Faker, and definitely underperformed. You get the same tier of challenge when it comes to history and also recency in Rookie, and he needs to perform here. Yeah, in my opinion, Rookie was the best player at the 2000. 18 World Championship. And if Dom Juan wants to reach their aspirations, which would also be the World Championship, Showmaker has to be in that conversation. And I think because Rookie slumped in Summer Split, but actually looked quite good here in the group stage, it would be a massive stepping stone if Showmaker can show up today. And I think Showmaker just needs to kind of take the next step in his evolution as a mid laner, where he is such a phenomenal laner, but he needs to be able to impact the map to the same degree that someone like Rookie can. And that's kind of where I feel like this giant gap is between Rookie and these other mid laners. I think Rookie and Faker, not only are they perfect in lane, but then the amount of pressure that they put everywhere else on the map is unmatched. Mm -hmm. The second solo laners we have to talk about in the top lane, we said already a little bit of a rivalry yeah. brewing, the Shy and Nagari. First question. Question, who's the best flat? The Shy. It's probably the Shy. Okay. Based on history, I will say the Shy, but I can't wait to watch these guys play because the Shy actually is also super greedy, but for apparently doesn't admit to it. <laughs> he doesn't buy control wards. He buys one control They're ward every 16 chat. and a half minutes. That, that 75 gold every 60 minutes, maybe if he bought a No Man's Medallion and took Kleptomancy, uh -huh, he could afford yeah, more control now wards. you're selling me Ooh, on maybe it. Maybe take a page from that book. From These guys are both great, and I actually wish we could stop junglers from going up there so they could actually duel, but we're going to see what happens. Meet me at Baron 1v1. <laughs> the cool thing about Nagari is innovation, because while you'll give the slight advantage to the Shy, it was Nagari who really understood the runes and brought out the early 20% CDR, another 25% from runes, and getting to 45% early in the Casper Cup the first mm -hmm. tournament played on these new patches. So he can definitely push forward. He's trying Klepto every champion. There's Klepto in solo queue. There's Klepto against some top laners. And there's taking Kleptomancy and getting no lane real impact against the Shy. We might be brewing for some real fire. Oh, I this hope he Let's see. Um, we talked before about kind of the first games and how people might be playing a little bit, a little bit safe. I do mm -hmm. feel like this is a game in which both teams will want to flex their muscles, or am I reading that incorrectly? No, I definitely think that there is kind of that grudge match that's brewing yeah. if you look at interviews. And we've already talked about how these teams really want to kind of attack through their solo laners, which means I'm looking at the support staff surrounding the solo mm -hmm. laners. I'm looking at the jungle matchup, and I'm looking at these bot laners. And for me, Focusing on bot, I think that Jackie Love is the better ADC, but I think that Nuclear and Barrel are the better 2v2. And so I'm curious what the matchup is, because I think this is so draft reliant. I think it's just more performance on the day. I don't really put too much into the duo there, because sometimes Barrel just says, screw it, Alistair, I'll roam, rather than focusing on the 2v2. I think neither of them really focus on the 2v2. Balan feels like his champion pool is pretty top heavy, his Rakan, obviously, super duper famous. And there's just the real chance that Damwon Gaming pick up a non-traditional AD carry and try to avoid lane, because Kai'Sa is going to be super high priority for both. We'll see what happens. Damwon do need to win to catch up to IG in this group, and overall it would be mm -hmm. a very important win. I think also for the Damwon naysayers um, who are lurking now, because they haven't performed to that maybe top level we had expected. So I'm wondering what your expectations oh. are and your predictions for us, Damwon or IG and why? Uh, I picked Damwon, uh, and it was actually a really tough one. I think that this will come down to support staff difference in terms of uh, Canyon in the jungle particularly. I think that Lian hasn't gotten the best tape behind him. Some games domestically he has popped off, but he doesn't have a ton of experience. And I think the 2v2 jungle will, will be the difference maker here. So I'm edging on Damwon, but it was very, very close. I'm going to continue my broadcast trend, it seems, of, bro of betting against my region. I do think that it's going to be an Invictus Gaming victory. I think that on stage they've looked better. I think they have a huge skill upgrade in the AD carry position. I've seen nothing to really go against it as a point. So I'm ready to be surprised, but I'm going to wait for it when it comes to Damwon Gaming. 
I think this is an incredibly close match. Mm -hmm. I also did all of my predictions before anything started, and I'm going (laughs) Dom one. But I have a real reason to back it up as well, and I feel like IG's early games, even in the game against AHQ, have been pretty weak, and they've had to rely on kind of outskilling and outmacroing their opponents. I don't think they're going to be able to do that against Damwon, so that's why I edge them very slightly. I think that's a, a good read on it, but I said it could go either way, and we have a complete 50-50 50, because 50. the fans are going for the world champions. Could be a safe bet. We'll see. Uh, it'll be a very interesting one as well to see how the DNA of this group is going to evolve and what kind of a chance Team Liquid then has to beat out these two or AHQ. We'll see what happens. Game one is minutes away, and today we are ready for some magic in the bot lane.